hear me? It's okay? All right, awesome. So uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, you know, one of the previous speakers, when they started, they kind of pointed to the audience and they said, I work with X on Y, I work with Z on T. So if five years from now I could be here on the same stage and say the same thing, that would be pretty awesome. So I'm a newcomer to this, uh, to this community and I want to give a shout out to uh, the, the organizers, especially Dan Eder, for, for inviting me to come and chat with you guys. Okay, so let's see. Let me get used to the clicker and vice versa. So I think as opposed to some of the previous uh, talks, the, the theme would continue from the previous speaker, but you'll see that we are doing, I think, cutting edge applications. I'll present it to you, but we're using it with very standard tools, and part of, of my excitement in coming here is I would love to have some of you tell me, oh, dude, you should be using model one, you should be using model two, you should be using model three. So I'll show you some of that. And then, you know, incoming PhD students at Stanford, I tell them the following, right? There's only two types of AI researchers in the world now. Those who work with healthcare data and those who haven't worked with healthcare data yet. Now, why do I say that, right? Uh, genomics data is soon to surpass YouTube in the amount of bits you can share through. Um, the market size is wonderful, right? $24 billion uh, compound annual growth rate of, of two digits, right? So, so companies love this, academics love this, and uh, healthcare, as I've recently learned, has become the biggest business in the US. So it even surpasses retail, for better and worse, right? So it's big business, um, and I will try to give you very, very briefly one slide of Genomics 101, so the talk is in some sense um, self-contained. Uh, if you haven't done much biology since junior year, whatever, many of us in the field have started that way, and you can see I can self-define this, this talk in a single slide. So let's go through it together. Your genome is essentially the operating system that runs every cell in your body. Three billion letters over a four-letter alphabet. Okay? You get half of it from mom, half of it from dad, plus 100 mutations that are unique to you, that are sprinkled around in these two halves. Uh, this genome codes for 20,000 subroutines. Each of, each of which we call a gene. So 20,000 genes in the genome. And the simplest type of disease that can happen from these mutations to the text of your genome are diseases that take out or impede in the work of a single gene in your genome. So you can hit a single gene, even with one letter, and you can get a, a very nasty disease. And the human body, one of the most amazing things about the genome is the human body is wonderful at code reuse. So you can change one letter in one subroutine and you would have five affected tissues. Why would you have five affected tissues? Because that code subroutine is critical for how those five tissues uh, develop, okay? So simple in the genome, complicated in how it presents itself to the clinicians, right? I come in with heart issues and then I get liver issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Simple one side, complicated on the other side, okay? That's it, so if you haven't zonked out yet, let's immediately go to Genomics NLP 101, okay? So uh, imagine I present you with a patient, okay? That patient has a medical record, so something between 1,000 and 10,000 words in which the doctors try to describe a set of phenotypes that the patient seems to suffer from, some issue with the liver, some issue with the heart. We have a structured vocabulary of over 11,000 terms to describe different issues that people have. Okay? Now that patient has already been sequenced, the genomics works has been done, and that person presents to you with 300 suspicious looking mutations in 300 genes. So you have a set of phenotypes and you have a set of genes, each of which has a funny looking mutation that you've never seen, for example, in any healthy individual. Okay? I also give you access to 26 million papers. Okay? So if you have 26 million papers, five to 10 phenotypes, and 300 candidate genes, your goal, a diagnosis for a clinician is the following, right? Find me one or more papers in the 26 million such that it talks about one of the patient's candidate genes, and it shows that that gene, when mutated, causes the patient's set of phenotypes. Can you guys see the query? This is a query over unstructured text. 
right? How is this solved by professional today? This is solved by what we fondly call a doctor Google approach. Why do we call it a doctor Google approach? We put a doctor, a highly paid, highly trained, highly busy clinician in front of a Google search box and we say, go ahead, make my day, right? This is how these things are solved these days in practice, in clinics, day in and day out, in the best clinics with the best clinicians, right? So, so Dr. Google is expensive and unsustainable, right? We can now diagnose 5,000 different diseases that come from mutation to 3,500 different genes. So our ability to diagnose is wonderful. However, or I should also, however, um, each of these diseases separately is rare. These are rare diseases. So the clinician who is seeing the baby or the, or the patient has never seen, it's not like, oh, you know, it's the flu season. Oh, another flu patient. I look at a patient for five seconds, flu, flu, flu. The, the clinician has never seen this patient before, a patient like this before. They have no prior knowledge that they can rely on. But cumulatively, if you take all of these 5,000 diseases together, they affect 5% of the population. This is huge. This is 7 million babies a year are affected by these types of diseases. Okay? So, um, you know, it takes a highly trained clinician on average about a work week to solve one case, okay? You go through the 300 genes, read the literature, read about the genes, try to connect one gene to the patient's set of phenotypes. About a week work for one trained clinician. Okay, now, sequencing on the other hand has gone berserk, right? Thousand dollar genome, we can sequence the hospital tomorrow if we wanted to. A thousand bucks, what is that in the California healthcare system? Two cups of water and a Band-Aid, right? Thousand bucks, okay? So, uh, it is, what, the step one is going to happen. We are going to sequence, experts predict, that we're going to be sequenced around 60 million genomes in the coming years just because we can. Who's going to diagnose all these people? Right? I need 60 million work weeks. I won't even tell you what's the, what the, the workforce in, the, in, this, in this domain is. We don't have 60 million work weeks, right? Um, now, as we first chose and others chose after us, when we had some of the tools that I'll show you, it's not even that, you know, we can currently diagnose about 30% of cases that seem solvable. But genomics is magic. It's magic. It's not like a blood test, right? In a blood test, if you have a blood test, if the doctor orders a blood test and it, it seems normal, you come back in a year and you say, dude, I'm still sick, they take a new blood test. They don't look at the old blood test. Genomics is different. You know, what we've shown there is that if you actually take negative genomes that haven't been solved a year ago, you don't call the patient back in, you don't raise their expectations, you just look at it again, 10 to 15% of them are solved, partly because a paper just came out in the year that you haven't seen your patient that tells you which gene does it for your patient. Okay, so it's not just about analysis, it's about reanalysis. You want to go back and reanalyze your patients constantly if you can. Who's going to do that, right? So I want to give you like a glimpse, a couple of glimpses into the future uh, that we are trying to imagine for genetic diagnosis, right? Step number one, I have the medical record. I need to extract phenotypes from it. So we went, went on and we used, you know, I'll show you the kudos in the end, uh, Cole and Johannes in the, in the lab used lemmatization, rule-based heuristics over the cases that we could look at, sentence and sub-sentence splitting, tag words to make us aware of when the phenotype describes the patient's father but not the patient, so we don't want to grab the patient's father phenotype, we want to grab the patient's phenotype, et cetera, et cetera. So we've built this system that I'll show you its performance in a second that can extract phenotypes from the thousands and millions of medical records that are accumulating at the, at the hospitals. And then we also can do cool tricks like when we have all of the patient's phenotypes, we can start asking, hold on, what if I give an automated system like the one I'll show you next, just a subset of the phenotypes? Maybe the system will do better if I don't show it the laundry list of 100 phenotypes. Maybe I don't want to show it the more common phenotypes. I want to focus on the more rare phenotypes, et cetera. So we can suddenly do tricks like that. Let me show you for a second. So, you know, this is part of the future, right? All I'm showing you here is how much time it takes clinicians and two competing approaches to extract the phenotypes from the patient. Uh, the bottom line is it takes about 15 minutes for a highly trained physician or clinician 
to extract phenotypes from your medical records. Uh, it takes uh, clean strain, this tool that we built, less than five seconds to do the same. Okay, so that means that a work week of a highly trained clinician is done in 12 minutes. This is the future we have to bring on board. We just have to bring it for the quantities that I showed you a minute ago. Okay, so, right? We are far from perfect. We're better than the other tools. We're much faster than them. We're better than them at precision and sensitivity. But you know, those numbers should probably reach higher. So that, that's one exciting reason for me to come and chat here and see if there are, you know, put on a Stanford t-shirt if somebody wants to remember who I am and then go find me later uh, to chat. Okay, so, so this allows you, right, to get phenotypes out of medical records. Now you want to take the phenotypes, the list of genes that comes from the genomics, and you want to plunge into the 26 million papers, and you want to find the one or more papers that gives a diagnosis for your patient. So here again, this is a work led by Johannes. You can find both of them in BioArchive. Both of them are now in revisions, in revision phases, and will come out soon. Um, right, we've put the things that we know how to do, right? We've taken dictionaries, slapped synonyms on top of them, used DAGs whenever we can, um, looked at permutations of words to match uh, phenotypes that are described by multiple words, et cetera, et cetera, and built a set of TFIDS-based logistic regression classifiers that does conceptually the following. We get all the abstracts from PubMed, then we train a classifier that decides, you know, only a fraction of these 26 million talk about single gene diseases. So we train our first classifier to say, this paper might be of interest, that paper is not of interest. That's our first classifier. Then there's wonderful software, there's been like a wonderful battle that has been won between academia and publishers, right? Publishing is this wonderful business of printing money, you write the papers, I get the copyright, people pay me subscription, and, I, and I'm king, right? And I won't even let you crawl it. So, so over the past five to 10 years, um, all these doors have been opened. All these barriers have been broken down. There's now beautiful software that effectively allows you to get full text of all of these 26 million papers. I think we recently computed if we really wanted all of them, it'll take us about a week on Stanford infrastructure to get all of them. And of course, some institutions like here just have those data and a lot more, right? So um, we get all the full text that we want, almost all of them here. Now we can do even better than that. And we start extracting all the entities in this particular example, genes and phenotypes and some attributes of them that we can extract from the paper and try to link them uh, to each other. So at the end of the day, what we have is we have this fairly complicated classifier that tries to classify a paper, a gene, and a set of phenotypes, right? The patient set of phenotypes, the gene that is discussed in the paper, or the genes that are discussed in the paper, and the phenotypes that are attached to the gene, and we have a machine learning, no, sorry, we have an information theory-based Bayesian network that tries to say, okay, if the paper was read correctly, the paper brings in this set of phenotypes, your patient has that set of phenotypes, how well do they match? Because one other, I don't know, uh, challenging thing in, uh, in uh, medicine is that not two patients look the same. So you cannot just dictionary compare your patients, you have to use this direct elasticly graph to say these phenotypes overlap in a really substantial way. Okay, so this is the approach we try. Like I said, there are details on BioArchive. I'm happy to chat with people about them as well. We do well. Okay, so this is when you spike in 215 patients, each of which real patients, each of which has roughly 300 candidate genes, you want your automated system to rank the causal gene as number one. So when a clinician, you know, at the end of the day, you can never get rid of the clinician. You don't want to get rid of a clinician if you think of it as a patient. You want a human being to look at the diagnosis and say, for the next 20 years, we're going to treat you based on that. But you want the system to do all the work. So when the system is finished and the clinician is presented with evidence, we hit the causal gene on the head in 66% of cases. So we beat manual curation-based approaches because we can grab all this literature and because our scoring algorithm is also better, scoring function, but it's not at 100. And it's only 200, it's only 200 patients and we want to cover these 5,000 diseases and, and, and you know, kick ass, if I'm allowed to say that, on all of them. So, so there's more work for us to do and there's a lot more for us to learn in this domain. All right, so there's an app for it. 
Uh, you can go and check it out. Amelie, don't start for the new. There's a fancy acronym. And also, if you haven't seen this movie, go see this movie. We picked it for the tagline, she'll change your lives. So if you know what happens with, with patients, when you give a patient a diagnosis, you have changed their lives. You've changed their lives, their family's life. The clinicians know what to do with them. They have support groups for the specific mutation, et cetera, et cetera. All right, last but not least, you know, or, or before I go into last but not least, there's like this vision hovering around this which I think is an amazing vision for us as computer scientists. The future healthcare systems are going to have these demons run in them, demons in the sense that we think of them in computer science. And these demons are constantly going to try to do good by the patients because all the data is there and our knowledge keeps going. You know, data keeps coming in, knowledge keeps coming in. And instead of clinicians, what's it called, pooling data when you come into the clinic or, you know, when they do the two yearly round, this system is going to be always there, and it's going to push to the clinicians when it has new insights about your patients. This is the future that people like us should bring, up, should bring about, and that's part of what we're trying to imagine there. Okay, last but not least, you know, I've been a, a huge NLP aficionado, right, a, a, an armchair aficionado or whatever, for a long time, and I'll try to give you a sense why, right, long before we got into healthcare. Right, so there's this general business of working in genomics and genetics. We have this data, we have this funnel, I call it, okay? We have tons of data. Imagine like 10 to the, 10 to the 14 data points. And then we have 10 to the six hypotheses that we generate. So a huge reduction from data to hypotheses, but I can test 100 hypotheses. Sometimes I can test 10 hypotheses, and if I make three discoveries, that's an awesome day in the lab. But most of, our, of my hypotheses are either false or I cannot prove them. So, you know, there are a thousand good hypotheses in my million, and if I can only test 10, I do not want to close my eyes and pick 10. That would be a bad day in the lab, right? So, so what often happens for us is we come up with these hypotheses with all this genomics or, or whatever stuff, but there's this amazing body of literature out there that we can now download all of it in a week, and it comes in this amazing property. I've seen this now for maybe like a dozen applications. So if you want to think of some general purpose or more general machinery that people from this community can provide us, it's almost always true that if I find the right supporting evidence in the literature, I have an amazing hypothesis. So if I stand in front of a million hypotheses and I can test 10 and 100 of them are correct, 57 of the 100 would have indications in the 26 million papers. But I cannot sit there and just Google away, even as a research student, I would just like Google away for like a half day or a day. So I just keep seeing over and over and over again how semi-generalized pipe like this would be a huge boon for multiple, multiple communities. All right, so with that, let me uh, wrap. I'll say thank you to John Bernstein, he's the, he's the chief of medical genetics at Stanford, who's been a collaborator for the last few years. Johannes, Kartik, and Cole led the two works that I've shown you today. And there are many other people in the lab that have helped. And if I have a minute and 30 seconds, I would love to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Please. Doctors do it today. Um, and the second question is, not every phenotype can be observed in a patient doctor setting at a clinic. Uh, genes may manifest themselves in ways you cannot observe the phenotypes in a patient doctor setting in a clinic. These seems like huge challenges right now to this approach. I just want to know your thoughts on this. Yeah, so, so there are two guys of the same question in some sense. Uh, first of all, you shouldn't think of yourself going to the doctor and talking about a headache. You should think of severely sick babies, okay? So when they are born, there's an entire medical system that is geared at making sure they survive. There's a neonatal intensive care unit. They, these folks 
would, me, would venture between liver experts and heart experts and pulmonary experts because they show severe, severe phenotypes. And the medical system has specialized for, I don't know how many hundreds of years, in finding as many of those as it can. It will not always find all, and you would always be working in missing data. It's not just that you have missing data. I told you not all patients look the same. Even the textbook and the patients mostly agree, but no, it's not a one-to-one -one dictionary match. But we can still, where was that thing before the big stick comes over uh, and pulls me off? These are real patients from a heterogeneous set, and we do pretty darn well with all of these caveats. We put the causal gene on top, you know, in the five, in the top three for any some percent of them. So even though we have this missing data, you know, at some point, once you've scrutinized the kid enough, there is a set of indicative phenotypes that will just point to one disease. So it works. The bottom line is it works, despite all these I think fascinating challenges, it, it's already working. Okay. All right, awesome. Okay, thank you guys.